rising above all the noise a little bit. I don't know if you had the same feeling I do that there was a lot of noise at this show about TV everywhere and the over the top competitors that have prompted the pay TV industry to get busy with this initiative. Um, but there obviously was. And um, we uh, have been studying this for about two years now. I wanted to call out uh, Eric Brandon, the head of our uh, US TV intelligence service there in the audience who's nice enough to be videoing this for me. But um, uh, about, for about two years, he and his team have been gathering basically every deal point, everything that happens in the TV everywhere space and building a database out of it. And that's what put me in a position to kind of sit down over the last month or two and put on the thinking cap and try and figure out what it all means. So in the search for some clarifying principles amidst uh, the confusion of this brewing battle, um, I turned to the earliest known strategy guide, uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War, which uh, I've read many, many times over the years, and I suspect it would be true, but he has a lot to say that I think is relevant to this kind of a battle between two industries that have uh, locked horns in this uh, fight to capture the uh, consumer of the future. So here's what's touched off this war, or really probably more accurately opened up a new front, because it's really about a 20-year-old war between the internet and existing uh, media models. Uh, really starting with the launch of Netscape and the World Wide Web in, uh, in 1994. Bottom line is this, the TV networks who've had this business alone to themselves for 40 years are no longer the only way to get video content piped into your home over a network. So that's what's kicked off this new front in the war. Um, and uh, the common wisdom already seems to have arrived at the conclusion that the over-the-top services are going to crush pay TV ultimately, this whole cord cutter theory that's been propounded uh, for the last couple of years. Um, and what's interesting, it occurred to me, is that um, whether that's a good thing or not very much depends on where you are in the technology and media value chain, obviously. So for the companies at this show, of course, over the top victory would probably be generally a good thing. Very few of them have much business at all with pay TV networks. All of them have a kind of a play of some kind in the over the top space, whether it's tablets or services or you know a host of different things that we saw on the show floor this week. So they'd be the winners with OTT wins. Um, obviously, the internet service providers themselves who are fighting the battle would be big winners if they can prevail against uh, or even make headway against pay TV operators who have a dominant position at this point. Um, and. Uh, the, um, uh, the pay TV operators, of course, the other side of that coin, disaster for them to the extent that OTT cuts into their business. And of course, the studios and the networks are in the kind of enviable position, maybe, of being the arms dealers to both sides in this. It's always a good place to be in a war, um, as long as you don't get trampled yourself. And of course, that's what they're spending full time worrying about as they watch this happen. So Sun Tzu's most important maxim, I think, is this one. You know, he essentially guarantees victory to those who not only understand their own strengths and weaknesses very well, but have a good understanding of the enemy and what his position is. So, in fact, you know, understanding and knowledge is so important, he devotes the last chapter of the book to, quote unquote, the use of spies, where he says that uh, to fail to know the conditions of your opponents because of a reluctance to give re reward for intelligence is not the characteristic of a victorious chief. Let's start with the key thing uh, that we need to know and a key question. The key thing we need to know, I think, is the obvious one. That the war between the over-the-top internet service providers and the cable TV and the pay TV industry really is going to uh, change the way media is delivered in many, many ways for good. And um, we're just seeing the very tip of the iceberg of that, and we're going to describe a lot of that. But I, I, I think the main point I want to make is that we ain't seen nothing yet. And that therefore calls really kind of the most important question uh, to ask yourself if you're a player on either side of the space is, you know, who are your enemies and who are your allies and who could be your allies uh, on this battlefield? So let's take a look at what we've learned so far in just the few years that this uh, battle's been, been uh, being waged. Much of Sun Tzu's advice revolves around this general idea of leveraging your enemy's assets on your own behalf. And I think that's very much, you can see what the OTT guys have done, uh, exactly that. They're basically riding the high-speed networks that these very pay TV networks put in place over the last 15, 20 years. Um, uh, and uh, doing a better job of it in many, many ways than the uh, pay TV operators themselves. But what I'm going to suggest in this uh, talk and, and outline some of the ways I think it can happen is that the best way for pay TV operators to respond is by adapting some of the very cool things the internet guys have brought to the table um, and uh, make them their own. And I think that's what they've already started to do with TV Everywhere.
So if they succeed in beating back this threat, uh, just to take a little trip down memory lane here, um, it will really be to accomplish something that few have done before in the face of the internet threat. Um, for example, um, the, the, the big issue here is proprietary uh, networks versus open internet, right? And the very first battle of that was really opened up immediately upon the launch of the internet in the mid-90s um, when uh, AOL and CopyServe and Prodigy, all the pioneers of, inter of connectivity, basically completely owned the connectivity market through dial-up connections. And um, it was widely believed, frankly, even by me, that they had some stuff going for them that the open internet couldn't really approach and that they would weather the storm. Um, and, um, you know, it's really kind of the, the, the really interesting point about that was that one of the companies most actively subverting this dial-up proprietary network model was Time Warner with its cable operation at the time, who was building the Roadrunner network to do open internet, high-speed access to the home. Uh, and they made the colossal blunder, blunder as late as 2000, believe it or not, of buying AOL in what turned out to be the peak year for dial-up access. Uh, dial-up subscribers started declining months after AOL, uh, Time Warner closed the deal and became briefly AOL Time Warner. Um, when you put aside the connectivity side of things, even if you're just looking at the open internet, um, it was widely believed at the time that the content sites that were modeled on traditional media sites where humans were doing the collating and gathering of the data and opining on it and, and organizing it for the consumer were going to win out over sites that were just sort of more of the freeform uh, world of the internet that existed at the time and still exists. Um, but it wasn't clear how that was really going to succeed with the consumer at the time. So Yahoo, if you recall, 1998, spent $5.7 billion buying Broadcast.com because it had the most users of a video service on the web. And that seemed like a good thing to own. That $5.7 billion works out to about $10,000 per user. And these are just users, not subscribers. You know, a paid subscriber spending 900 bucks a year with a cable operator today is worth about... Uh, $5,000, so they paid twice that for people who they had no, no hold over, really, in a marketing sense. So, um, you know, there were crazy times and some crazy deals got made. Just about that time, Google launched um, and began proving that algorithms actually were better at organizing all the content on the internet than Yahoo's editors. Um, and we kind of all know what's happened since then. You haven't heard from Broadcast.com since then. Yahoo stock is about a third of what it was at the time. And of course, then the user-generated uh, site YouTube came along in the, in the 2000s um, and proved that you didn't have to do cur curating at all. Basically, consumers were avidly consume whatever anybody put up on the internet by way of video. And they're still the leading video provider on the internet. But the real value destruction um, to the media industry uh, from the internet has been come to some really two of the oldest media out there, um, news, newspaper package, uh, you know, delivered media, newspapers and um, uh, music. So here's what happened to newspapers. Um, newspaper revenues have been cut in half in the last six, seven years from uh, internet competition. Their most lucrative piece of it was classifieds, of course, and Craigslist has just detonated that business. And, uh, but now it's infecting their local business of, uh, selling ads to car dealers and everybody locally as well. So that business is, is mightily struggling. Music's had it even worse, of course. It's uh, uh, more than cut in half um, since uh, the peak in 2000. And that's even including what's a pretty decent sized uh, digital music delivery business on iTunes and other uh, services. Uh, CD sales are off more like 60 to 7% um, during that same time frame. So it's more often the case that it has been so far that the internet wins. So the question then is, um, how will video fare now that bandwidth is expanded to, to, lot, to allow this kind of high quality video delivery um, over the internet? What's interesting is that um, really the competitors, the pay TV companies, are the ones that have basically enabled this threat to come after them um, by building all this high speed internet access. Um, and we're now at a point with uh, high speed access uh, passing 80 million homes that we think in five years there'll actually be as many broadband connections in the US homes as there are pay TV subscriptions. So that's a very different world than we've ever seen before. The problem so f till very recently for the internet had been it had picked the wrong model essentially to try and exploit video on the internet. 
it thought that the two big businesses of a lot of it was because of the excitement about DVD sales, which got huge, $14 billion in 2004. Um, and video rental, of course, which had been huge for years, and video on demand on cable and DBS and the telcos um, were decent sized businesses. That's the gray area in the chart. And so it was kind of natural to think that that's what you'd want to emulate as you offered video on the internet. Um, you know, publishers had not been able to sell subscriptions. It was not at all clear that, that there was a model beyond rental and sell through. And of course, what's happened since then is again, uh, Netflix co opting something from the enemy, the subscription model. and. Uh, and running with it. And, you know, when you think about it, why wouldn't they? Um, uh, this is to expand the pie and add pay TV to the mix of what people spend money on in the home to get video. It's by far the biggest component, you know, far bigger than all the other ones combined, in fact. You know, basically the all-you-can-eat subscription has long been the American consumer's favorite way to get video into the home. And Netflix is applying that on the internet side and, of course, doing, doing fabulously well with it, about $3.3 .3 billion last year, they and the other uh, internet subscription services. Whereas uh, digital retail is only about a billion, digital rental is only about $600 billion. So um, that's the gray bar at the top. You see, finally, we're getting some liftoff for spending on internet video, and most of that, again, via Netflix. So another great maxim from uh, Sun Tzu, to act according to the situation is to seize the advantage by adapting one's plans. And of course, we've seen an incredible amount of adaptation, um, first really from the OTT guys, but now more and more from the TV Everywhere guys, and that's gonna be the guts of what we get into as we kind of look at the uh, current alignment of the forces here. So destination anywhere. Um, this is, uh, kind of a, a timeline, if you will, of uh, how the thinking and, uh, and development work has gone for TV everywhere. Um, it started off with this idea that these internet services are providing video to PCs and laptops. We should be providing uh, video to PCs and laptops. And of course it turned out that, yeah, two minute YouTube videos are highly attractive on a laptop. Uh, even half hour TV shows, much less hour TV shows or two hour movies are not so attractive on laptops except to kids who live on their laptops. So um, as that realization dawned and there wasn't much usage of TV or everywhere uh, services on, on computers, um, the focus shifted really again because of Netflix to internet connected TVs. They got the deal with Xbox, suddenly they were reporting billions of views a month, most of them on the Xbox connected to TVs. And it occurred to the cable and the, to the pay TV industry and everybody else that, uh, of course, people basically like to watch TV on TV, and that's where you need to be. Uh, but that the internet could be a great way to, to dramatically expand what you provide on that TV beyond your scheduled programs and your and your VOD offerings. And a similar thing kind of happened on the uh, portable side, where there was initial efforts to get to smartphones. Nobody was much interested, uh, at least in the states. It's bigger overseas, of course, but um, there was not a lot of interest in watching it. Uh, video on smartphones, um, but suddenly in the last couple of years that problem's uh, been solved in the form of the iPad and other tablets. Now you've got a video screen that really does make an attractive proposition to watch video on, um, and the focus is, is shifting from phones to tablets. So another progression has been um, that uh, it was all about on-demand video to start with, and uh, yes indeed people love on-demand video, but they also would love to be able to watch their live channels wherever they are at any time. So uh, the most, uh, starting about two or three years ago, most of the deals were all about enabling uh, pay TV operators to take uh, the content off the TV and stream it throughout the house over a, a, a home network. But really to me, the most interesting thing going on now is the dramatic expansion of deals allowing out of home streaming. Um, and part of that has been uh, sort of technologically enabled by Sling and, and the, well really by Sling, the one way you could do that without uh, the rights to do it. But what's happening because of the popularity of that is that uh, everybody is now pursuing those kinds of rights to do out of home streaming. And then finally, DVR content. People are building up these huge libraries of content on their DVRs, and all they can do is watch it on their TV. A lot of the technological and deal developments recently have been to allow first whole home DVRing where you can watch it on any TV in the house. But now, um, next step, out of home streaming of that same DVR content. And then uh, a f recent step for several of the players in the business, uh, two of them anyway, the DBS players, to uh, allow download and go where you can take the content off of the DVR, put it on your portable and take it with you. As the future goes then, we'll get to that sort of at the end. 
but um, and we'll talk there about what we think are mo actual money-making opportunities. That, not the first one so much. The first thing uh, the industry seems focused on is using all these great internet technologies to finally get us off the grid interface that has been what we've been saddled with in pay TV for all these years. So most interesting one there is that I've seen so far has been uh, X1 from Comcast that they're now starting to roll out. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the pictures of that about how they're dramatically improving the user interface and using portable devices to control the TV um, in a way that makes it a much better experience. Um, but we think ultimately um, there's going to be need to be an effort to make money on this. Um, right now it's been all defensive, but the next stage we think will be kind of the going on the offense and figuring out how we can help pay operators can make money uh, through TV everywhere. So um, a funny thing happened in the transition from the PC targeted early TV everywhere efforts to the connected TV, uh, which is that Apple launched the iPad. As seen here, um, you know, TV connectivity generally was all about game machines through about 2010, that's the blue line. Um, and not a lot of video happening over it, some, but mostly it was game playing uh, going on over the internet was the main impetus for connecting your TV through an Xbox or a PlayStation at that point. Um, but since then we've seen BD players, dedicated set-tops like Apple TV and Roku, uh, TVs with built-in connectivity themselves, uh, and even pay TV set-top boxes now um, with internet connectivity built in. And each of those now, just this last year, has reached between 10 and 20 million homes that have that kind of TV connectivity. But on the other hand, tablet users, believe it or not, hit 64 million US folks uh, just 10 days ago, the end of 2012. So, and we think that more than 140 million US consumers will have tablets uh, five years from now. So that's shifting not just internet strategies, of course, uh, for which it was really originally intended probably by Apple, although who knows what they've got cooking by way of their own Apple TV initiative and tying it to iPads. It should be very interesting to find out very soon. Um, but now, of course, um, the TV everywhere uh, world is being shaken up by that iPad too, and they're just the incredible number of homes that are requiring an iPad or another tablet at this point. So this is some findings from our database of TV Everywhere deals. And it shows two things I think that are interesting. Um, one is just how very aggressive uh, operators are being uh, in pursuing TV Everywhere rights um, and how relatively aggressive they are compared to each other. Um, as we can see, it's, it's really kind of, to some extent, the DBS and telco guys that are leading the way and aggressively going after these rights um, so far. And the second thing is that, um, you know, that although the gray bars are in many cases, this is just in four months from October to January here, by the way. So um, huge jumps in the number of deals in the last quarter or so. Um, and most of those in terms of live TV deals. Again, it was a very video on demand business, um, but now everybody's getting in the, into the game of, of providing live TV um, to uh, portables and, and otherwise outside the TV environment. So let's take a look at, uh, at who's doing what um, in uh, terms of uh, what each of the operators is up to. Um, and uh, if, I, if you don't mind, I'll kind of stick to my notes here because now we are to the sort of the just the facts uh, part of the presentation as it was billed. So I want to make sure I get, get the facts right here. Um, so many operators, especially smaller ones, are simply providing a portal to internet sites through their own internet site. Um, and that's really kind of their whole TV Everywhere strategy. Um, that's often just streaming sites of their network partners where you go through Joe Blow's cable system in Peoria um, and uh, log on to uh, ABC or, or Discovery or one of the uh, cable networks and uh, authenticate yourself by, with username and password that you are a subscriber to a pay TV service that has the rights to provide this and you stream it on the, on the network site. And then others are just simply passing you through to Hulu. Um, and uh, you're, you're kind of going in through their portal, but you're quickly off to Hulu just to stream free stuff on, uh, on Hulu. So Comcast instead is uh, focused, and others have too, but they've kind of led the way in focusing on providing subscribers with content directly uh, in the Xfinity environment that they've uh, decided to brand their uh, efforts behind. So that's both the Xfinity online portal, the Xfinity TV app, and the Xfinity TV player. Um, and the, therefore, rather than redirecting people to uh, other sites, um, they're basically keeping the customer to themselves. And um, that's you know, a very proprietary network kind of thing to do. 
Um, and uh, you know, we'll see if that works. Um, it seems like the smart move to make, though. Um, they were the first to offer an online uh, VOD portal. That was FanCast. It was announced here five years ago. And of course, that's morphed into all these other offerings. Um, they also are now offering uh, a decent amount, or at least a high quality uh, amount of, um, of live uh, streaming um, within the portal, and uh, even available outside the home uh, to a large degree. So ESPN, they have a deal with, uh, Turner for CNN, Disney Channel from uh, the same deal with ESPN, the Pac-12 network, BTN, Disney's other networks. So um, they, they did a big deal with Disney early, first thing this year to basically uh, renew their affiliation agreement and add lots of out of home and other uh, TV everywhere rights to the package. Um, so um, on the download and go front, um, Xfinity TV customers who subscribe to Showtime will soon be able to download hit original series to Apple and Android tablets and take them with them wherever they go. Um, and uh, they can also download content from Stars and Encore if they're subscribers to those networks for offline viewing. Um, and they're working on rights deals with other programmers to expand the amount of content uh, available on the uh, Xfinity player for, for offline viewing. So they're kind of, uh, again, uh, pushing the envelope in that direction. So T TWC's uh, strongest TV, TV feature, though, continues to be its offering of over about 300 live channels on computers, tablets, and smartphones. So really, the whole Time Warner package of channels um, is available for in-home. Uh, live streaming at this point. So it recently updated the, uh, its TV app to include VOD streaming on iOS devices. Um, and it's now entering a new phrase where um, it's just announced here at the show again. There was, of course, a lot of news about TV everywhere here. But there will now be a Time Order cable app on Roku, essentially providing the same 300 channels of live streaming that they have through, through other devices, but this time through Roku, Roku devices. Um, straight to the main TV set in the home, or frankly, any TV set in the home. Central to DirecTV's uh, TV strategy is the Nomad add-on uh, set-top, which allows you to uh, essentially download DVR content to up to five Android or iOS, or and iOS mobile devices, and does a cool thing where it automatically prepares anything you set up to be DVR, uh, to be DVR'd for loading, uh, side loading to uh, your, your portables. The other cool thing is that uh, it can dramatically expand your DVR capacity because you can plug extra hard drives into it. So anybody who's struggled with a lot of high def content on your DVR can appreciate the value of having say two terabytes or four terabytes or however much you want uh, daisy chained into, uh, into your uh, television system and have it available for <coughs> offloading to your, your portable devices. So DISH is probably, I think, uh, kind of ahead of the curve in many ways in what they're doing. They really started for them with the Sling Adapter that they bought several years ago, which uh, was an independent product for years, but now has been nicely integrated into what they're doing overall. Um, and it's cool because it really, it, it allows full live TV channel lineup streaming in home and out of home on any device that can get the internet, essentially. Um, so, um, and importantly, it also, it's not just whatever's playing on TV at that moment, um, which you can control from afar and get whatever you want, um, but you can reach into your DVR and stream anything on your DVR over the internet to wherever you are as well. So really a cool device when it was first announced, but obviously much cooler when integrated into a pay TV service like this. So it's also got an SVOD service uh, emulating Netflix. In fact, it's the original emulator of Netflix, Blockbuster at Home, uh, which offers thousands of uh, movies to stream on iPad, computers, and TVs. Um, and just this week at the show, they announced that uh, Sling functionality will soon be built into its uh, next generation of Hopper um, DVRs, and this is their monster two terabyte uh, hard drive with all the cool features like um, ability to automatically skip pre-recorded programming, uh, ads and pre-recorded -pre uh, network programming. Um, and the cool thing about that is by integrating into the box, of course, you no longer need to buy a sling adapter to, uh, to have that functionality. You just get a subscription with, with the hopper. So um, the, um, they also announced here the uh, Dish Anywhere app, or have recently launched the Dish Anywhere app, um, which then introduced the, uh, the download and go um, functionality uh, to portable devices in home. So you don't have to sling it now, you can download it to your devices at home and take it with you. And of course for plane travel and elsewhere, that's a, that's a key function. 
so in our view, they're kind of ahead of the curve and really where everybody else is probably headed from here. Um, really just offering what is to some degree the ultimate in TV everywhere in that um, you're getting access to S subscription video on demand, paid rentals, anything on your DVR, anything on the TV right now, anywhere you are, anytime. So some of the other operators, um, Cox is, um, uh, subscribers of Cox that download the Cox TV Connect app can watch live programming from about 56 networks on iOS devices within the home, including Fox Business, um, but mostly smaller networks at this point. They're just getting started. Um, they report that the iPad version of their app has been downloaded about 420,000 times. That's about 10% of their subscriber base. So um, with, uh, um, you know, they're getting a, a very high penetration level of, uh, of their uh, homes with their, uh, their apps. Um, they were the first authenticated partner to have access to Star Play and Encore Play back in October. Um, and they also have the Watch TV online portal featuring about 20 networks, mostly free, um, most of which, like Turner's, that require authentication as a Cox subscriber. Um, really in the shadows to some degree, compared to the larger operators, um, is, um, is Charter. Um, their strongest point is streaming VOD offering an audience engagement. Um, that they're using some TV everywhere features to, to effectively uh, do. Things, marketing programs like a point system and you can get SMS messages about uh, uh, new on-demand movie releases. Um, they're really trying to engage the consumer in a marketing sense using these technologies. Um, unlike other providers, they couple their VOD app with other functions like bill pay, email, and, and, other, and tech support. Uh, but they're not offering live cha channel streaming or download and go or DVR streaming or some of the other cool features that, that many others are starting to do. Fios offers FlexView VOD titles as its main TV Everywhere component. An extensive library, 25,000 titles in this library. Um, it offers uh, some of its TV lineup on smart TVs, game consoles, BD players, eliminating the need basically for extra set-tops around the home if you've got these other devices connected to other TVs. Um, there's 75 live channels available through Fios TV app on Samsung and LG smart TVs and Blu-ray players. 26 live channels available on Xbox 360. Um, and they also offer 20, 75 live channels, uh, but only on the iPad at this point for in-home access. Um, it was lagging behind in live in-home channels for streaming on mobile devices and computers, but in late uh, November 2000, it updated their iPad app to allow these 75 live TV channels in-home. But this still leaves them sort of behind Time Warner, uh, Cablevision, Comcast, and Dish, uh, and kind of on par with DirecTV and Cox when it comes to in-home live uh, channel offerings. So this main uh, component, FlexView, is, uh, also offers transaction-based, though. It's not just streaming of, of uh, content. It's, uh, there's rental itself and sell-through as well. Um, and I think that's important in that it kind of points to the future where I think operators are going to have to look for ways to start making money at this. Um, and, you know, obviously renting and selling content is one of those ways. Uh, they do not yet offer an SVOD service like Comcast's Stream Picks or Dish's Blockbuster at Home or Utopia or uh, AT&T, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but they will have it shortly in some form. Uh, we're not quite sure the details yet, but they're launching this uh, Redbox Instant uh, by Verizon service where you'll get uh, pay a monthly subscription that also gets you free Redbox subscriptions, which are almost free anyway, but uh, even, even more free uh, if you're a subscriber to this service. So Uverse, um, they're moderately strong, basically, in streaming VOD services available online in all, in all the mobile devices, iPad, iPhone, Android, even, in, even Blackberry, and even Windows phones, um, as well as the Xbox. Um, and it's just launched at the show its Screen Pack service, which is similar to Stream Picks, Futopia, and again, a kind of a cheaper version of, of uh, Netflix. Um, generally, these things are priced at about four bucks rather than Netflix's eight bucks. Um, it's got li limited live channel streaming, only about two channels, only two channels really, Fox and News and Fox Business. Um, and, uh, but it is partnered with Xbox to offer DVR streaming within the home. Um, but at this point, that's not being made available to new subscribers. Um, and uh, they say they're working on, uh, on getting it uh, available to new subscribers sometime later this year. So then Cablevision, um, its strongest feature is uh, TV to go live channel streaming available for all subscribed channels on PC, Mac, smartphone, and tablets, and the Kindle Fire. Only available in the home, but again, 
uh, it, as with Time Warner, it's every channel. Um, so your whole package is available to you on any device you've got in the home. Um, the streaming VOD side of their offering only has content from about 25 of the channels though. Um, and it doesn't offer at this point either downloading or uh, streaming off the DVR to other devices. So we sort of looked at it from the point of view of the operators and what kind of deal counts they're racking up. Uh, when you turn the telescope around on these deals and look at it from the uh, network's point of view, you get kind of a distorted view. Um, but distorted for a reason. There's basically been a very dramatic difference in how the network groups have addressed this, uh, this challenge of their operators coming to them and say, give us the rights, we want to go, go compete with uh, the over-the-top services. So. Turner was early um, and leads the pack by a long, long way, as you can see here in terms of the number of operators that's licensed for TV Everywhere um, applications and, of course, mostly for in-home applications at this point. Um, and that's why the next key frontier, as we see it, really will be um, uh, the out-of-home access deals, which, as we saw just in the last three months, have really dramatically expanded uh, across the board for all the operators. Another great maxim from, uh, from Sun Tzu, change the flags and standards of the captured chariots and add them to your own squadrons. So I think uh, it's really time at this point for the, key, the operators to turn the tables on the internet services who have kind of been doing this to them for several years now. Just as they adopted subscriptions and got into TV and got to the TV, you know, now pay operators in our view need to adopt the best of what the internet services have come to the table with. Um, and, you know, frankly, the key one, they've made the huge leap forward in simply getting off the TV as their only display device in the home and going elsewhere. But the question is, now what? So the most important improvement uh, um, I think internet service providers have brought to the table is just making it a much more pleasant experience to use television. Um, especially when it comes to searching and browsing for something to watch. Um, for, you know, two decades now since digital television came along, um, you're no longer, of course, having to scroll through channels themselves and, and surf the way you did with analog pay TV. But still, it's just that very limited five or six line grid for the most part. Um, and you're basically very limited in how much um, you, information you can get and how easy it is to, to navigate between the different so, forms of information. So um, it now looks like really the next round of improvements in this area though are not going to come from the internet guys, although again we don't know what Steve meant when he said to his biographer that he's uh, cracked the code on TV, but I assume it means some kind of dramatic uh, interface improvement because that's what Apple is famous for. Um, but until we see what's coming from Apple, um, I think we can uh, suggest realistically that uh, really one of the coolest things coming down the pike is X1 from, uh, from Comcast. They're just doing a very smart job of having, of integrating the, your iPhone and your iPad um, with the TV screen in a way that um, kind of takes advantage of the best of both. Um, obviously, searching, a much better thing with a keyboard where you can type in the first three letters of any word pretty much you'll get a list of, of everything. Um, the cool feature, for example, you type in Tom Cruise and it searches kind of all available sources um, and says, here's what you've got. Here's what's on your DVR already from Tom Cruise. Here's what's available on demand from, with Cruise in it. Uh, here's what's playing right now, if you want to tune it in. Um, and uh, here's what's coming up in the next week or so that you might want to DVR. So that can happen for genres, that can happen for actors, directors, you know, really any feature of content can be searched for and you get everything that's, you know, available from any source uh, put in front of you um, and you click and go. So um, that's uh, a great thing to do with the handheld. Um, you know, then they use the acreage of real estate that is on screen to just do a much better job of informing you about what's, uh, uh, what's available. Um, so it's no longer just the one line item with the three-word three name of the program, but, you know, photos, um, uh, actors, directors, uh, synopsis of the program, um, all of that. 
They're also, of course, integrating it uh, deeply with the web, as any decent web-based service should, um, so that as you're sc scrolling around, you can uh, either Facebook or tweet about stuff you find and let your friends know what you're up to. Um, and they're adding a host of, of uh, internet apps like Pandora, and more to come, I'm sure. Um, really, any internet app out there is going to want to be on every pay TV operator's uh, screens around the country. So uh, we'll, we'll see a lot more deals like that, getting things like Pandora and uh, Spotify and other um, great uh, entertainment services uh, on the uh, integrated into the uh, into the uh, pay TV environment. So um, so that's a big step forward using generally you know basically internet technologies to make TV better. Um, another whole set of them was on display uh, at the uh, Rovi booth. Rovi, of course, provides the existing grid to most of the cable operators in the country. Um, and it's working with Nuance, who are the brains behind Siri on the uh, iOS platform, to integrate natural language control into uh, basically iPad and iPhone apps initially. Um, and not only get us beyond either scrolling around and just accepting what's available to you in the grid, or even the step forward of being able to search with the keyboard, um, but the next step, and even beyond actually what Xbox is doing with the Connect, where you are saying very unnatural things like connect up, connect down. You know, there's no actually telling Connect what to do, you're just navigating a cursor on the screen. But here we're talking about real natural language recognition where, again, you just say Tom Cruise, and it gives you everything about Tom Cruise that's available to you. Um, or address it in a, you know, any number of ways uh, that will be interesting to see uh, what, uh, what develops there. But obviously, um, sitting across the room with a portable device and being able to speak into its microphone and control your TV, to me, is a, a, a big breakthrough that will, uh, will give um, pay TV operators. And you know, the OTT guys will employ this too, I'm sure. Um, but both sides are going to be dramatically improving the whole television experience with technologies like that that are tied to their TV Everywhere efforts. That leaves kind of the key question about who's going to pay for all this. Um, the companies are p spending fortunes developing this, uh, all these technologies. And eventually, and they are already starting, of course, to look for ways to monetize it. So, you know, to date, it's really been a defensive move, TV everywhere. But what's happening now, of course, as they go back to the networks for especially these out-of-home rights, the networks are saying, fine, but that's why we're even more justified in asking you for a 10% increase in the affiliate fee this year. So um, something like two to three cents uh, per sub per home is what the average network is probably going to be looking for um, to get from operators as they renew these deals and, and expand the rights. Um, and of course, you know, much higher for ESPN, much less for the 120th ranked network. Um, but whatever it is, it's going to start costing uh, operators more to provide these uh, these rights to consumers, and they're going to need to look for ways to uh, to get money out of it. So the first step they're already taking is uh, charging these small monthly fees for Netflix clones, essentially StreamVix and and the other SVOD uh, services that you can now add on to your basic service. But I wanted to highlight here. Um, really, two opportunities um, these new technologies are presenting. Um, because um, the first one is opened up by the fact that all of this activity coincides with the end of the unlimited data plan on uh, for portable devices. So, because of that, um, you know, there's really just no way that all of this content is going to be streamable to you over the cell network. Wi-Fi doesn't exist everywhere, and so really when it comes to uh, uh, portable portability of content, owning it is really where it's going to be at for the foreseeable future until you know, years and years from now. At this point, if you had used your data package up in a month and you then wanted to, to uh, rent or buy a movie, it could be as much as 50 or 100 bucks to download a, a high-def movie. So it's just not going to happen. So it's really got to happen uh, to, to fully have this, uh, this uh, functionality of uh, of being able to take it with you wherever you go. Um, of course, part of it is, is DVR, um, downloading from the DVR. But for new stuff that you might want to own or buy, um, the good news is that um, all of this also is coinciding with the launch of Ultraviolet. This is the uh, studio developed um, uh, system for enabling you to buy a movie once on any format, Blu-ray, DVD, or EST 
um, and register it in the cloud as yours, register your devices, and then uh, be able to enjoy it. Really, uh, actually, you don't need to register your devices as long as you're logged onto your, your ultraviolet compliant account with whatever retailer you bought the, the content from. You can play the content not only through that retailer's um, uh, apps, but any other retailer's apps, or I'm thinking any pay TV operator's apps. Uh, because in many ways, pay TV operators are perfectly positioned to be the ultraviolet service provider to the country. They've already got the consumers, and uh, you know they're looking for other ways to make those consumers happy. Um, why not provide that kind of, uh, of availability to everything you've ever bought? And of course, some very cool things are happening with Ultraviolet. They got to 9 million subscribers in 13 months since their launch, or I guess 14 months. Um, and uh, although a lot of that's sampling, you know, there are some very heavy users that are just absolutely enamored of this thing. The more content this study, studies the studios are doing are showing that the more content, of course, you've got in your ultraviolet locker, the happier you are as a consumer. Um, and they're starting to see some um, pretty phenomenal numbers on the EST side, in part because of ultraviolet enablement, but also because they're experimenting with lots of very cool uh, pre-DVD uh, EST availability. Fox tells me that, uh, for example, uh, when they started offering uh, movies for EST download at 15 bucks four months before they hit DVD. They saw basically uh, uh, starting in October, their comp title sales were about 350% of what they were last year. And actually since Christmas, when a whole bunch of new folks signed up for Ultraviolet um, and started using EST to get their Ultraviolet titles, um, they're now running about 450% ahead of, uh, of uh, like title performance from the year before. And so that uh, EST, and only partly because of ultraviolet, sure, the early window and the cheap price help, of course. Um, but um, what, uh, what had been, EST had been about 3% of studio first year ultimates of the revenue they generate from all sources in the first year of a title coming out. And it's now up to about 15% on these titles that are getting that full early release, cheap price, ultraviolet access kind of treatment. So, so there's some reason to think that this is, is going to work despite the early skepticism about it. Um, and um, and, uh, and it seems to me that, again, for pay operators, they're in kind of the perfect position with the ongoing relationship with the consumer um, to, uh, to be a key player in all of that. So that would be kind of a, uh, a, of course, a very internet kind of thing for them to do. Um, but again, that's what Sun Tzu's advice is, is, is adopt the techniques and tools of your competitors to, uh, to defeat them. So that's part of it, ultraviolet service provision, I think. But I think um, the big picture is this, for all of the consumers sitting at home, just kind of wondering what all this activity I keep hearing about is. What the hell is going on here? And I think they're only kind of dimly aware of, of where, where the industry is taking them. Um, and I think another opportunity exists in that for pay TV operators and that they've got long time relationships with these people. Um, they've improved them dramatically over the past 15, 20 years from the proverbial, you know, I hate my cable operator days of the 80s and 90s. Um, so they've got decent relationships with them, although of course everybody would rather pay less for their pay service. But the key then is to provide more service, obviously, to justify that price. And so I think there's a general position for pay TV operators to adopt, that they're in a perfect position to, to adopt, of being basically the digital lifestyle enabler for the consumer. And that means really not just your content stored in the cloud, uh, not just access to your DVR from wherever you are, um, but uh, basically full digital asset management the way companies pay uh, com other companies to provide them today um, so that all of your digital assets are in the cloud. All of your digital assets are backed up so if you lose your hard drive, your family photos and your family movies are safe uh, in your pay operator's cloud. And to me that's not just, uh, it wouldn't be worth just a value add, but that's something that really could be charged for and really is a, an example of, of uh, taking uh, uh, technologies and techniques um, that the internet's offering people at this point um, and adopting them as their own. So I think that's where TV everywhere leads to ultimately. Um, and uh, I guess we've got five minutes for questions if anybody does want to dig into any of these specifics or bring up some issues.
ecosystem player that is bringing a lot of innovation to the space and <coughs> I missed the last part. And what? Yeah, indeed. Um, well, I think you know, as I said at the start, in general, consumer electronics companies should be rooting for the OTT side. You know, it's obviously not many of them have huge businesses providing technology to uh, pay TV operators. Although maybe that can change. You know, as of course the pay TV operators get more and more like internet services and are providing more and more similar kinds of services. Um, so. Um, but I think, in general, um, you know, consumer electronics companies should should be collaborating as tightly as they can with the internet service providers to to take, frankly, as much business as they can from pay TV operators. Um, is their best play at this point? So, who wins the war? Do you have five-year forecasts to one pay TV versus those only using over the top versus those using over the top? We do. Um, I don't have uh, the exact numbers on the slide for you, sorry. Um, but in general, um, we, you did see some of it, actually. Let's back up. <clears throat> in fact, this is pretty much all the, all the pieces of the puzzle right here. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. There's the current situation. Um, we've got, for example, um, well, our view is that uh, pay TV revenue continues to climb, that um, sub counts decline because there is some not so much cord cutting as cord resisting from young people who are just not signing up the way older people do. Um, <clears throat> but on flat revenues with continued price increases, which we think they've proven they can get year over year for many decades now, uh, we think pay TV revenue continues to grow. Um, we've got physical uh, rental after a huge decline this year um, uh, starting to bottom out because of kiosks and, and continued, and, and Netflix's rate of decline has stopped pretty much, or not stopped, but slowed. Um, Sell-through, physical sell-through has, um, has actually, after dropping double digits for many years in a row, only dropped about 5% last year. And we think that's kind of partly ultraviolet, partly just better movies this year. But we think that business will, will not decline the way it has been and start stabilizing a little bit. And then on top of all of that existing, you know, 40-year-old businesses, uh, as you can see, the current slice of the over-the-top uh, pieces is, is just very, very small. Um, and really, uh, but we have seen really some signs of acceleration this year. We've got sell-through growing at about, um, electronic sell-through growing uh, 30 or 40 percent, and rentals about similar rate. Um, pay TV video on demand, on the other hand, is not growing much, if at all. Um, it's really one of the, the current kind of victim of, of the success of over-the-top services at this point. Um, but then the, the big growth story is, is, uh, is uh, subscription video on demand. Um, and, um, you know, it's gone from really nobody paying for it explicitly, but kind of implicitly including it in their Netflix bill, to first time it was paid for explicitly was the end of 2011, um, and boom, $3 billion this year. Um, but we think that's probably, um, you know, we're not going to see that kind of growth continuously for, for Netflix and the other subscription VOD providers. And I think things like StreamPix and the other SVOD offerings from, from pay TV operators will, will start cutting into their, their growth rates going forward. So we, don't, we have that growing, uh, some, I think, four and a half billion over the next five years. So that seems to be the model that, that people like on the internet. And, uh, and again, to your point about where CE companies can play a role, um, I think uh, focusing on subscription um, after all these years of waiting for first video on demand and then EST to finally catch fire with the consumer um, is the better bet. There, we got time for one more. Yeah. The quality of what of. Oh, I see what you're saying. I thought, right, I thought you were talking about the quality of programming. Just quickly on that front, you know, most of the rights out of home right now are pretty much the minor networks, not the major ones. But, you know, the breakthrough with the ESPN licensing first Disney and now several other operators this year for out of home really is bringing the quality of the content up. But you're talking about the, the video quality. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's impossible to say because it entirely depends on the Wi-Fi network you're on. 
you know. So that can be a fabulous experience, um, uh, you know, if you're screaming along at, at many megabits a second, or it can be absolutely unwatchable. So, you know, it's, it's really hard to generalize. But um, you know, I think the more important thing, as I said, is that the cell network is not up to this. Um, you know, it's not only up to, not up to it quality-wise, but just the volume involved in delivering video means that it just can't happen at a, at a reasonable price, given the lack of unlimited plans. So, um, and that's, I think, really a critical issue as to how this develops from here. Uh, because otherwise, of course, everybody would love to just be streaming whatever they've got on wherever they are and not worry about Wi-Fi ever again. But unfortunately, we're, we're going to be worrying about Wi-Fi for the foreseeable future because of that quality issue. Um, where do you see uh, services like HBO Go uh, playing in the ecosystem of, you know, the, the X1 or, or something like Comcast that's providing uh, a lot of the content for you? Uh, like, how do you see those coexisting? That's a good question. Um, uh, you know, I, I, to me, the idea that uh, that's been mouthed about a lot recently that HBO is going to go direct to the consumer uh, is just a bit crazy. <laughs> um, you know, the, their their future is bound with the pay TV operators. They know that um, they're basically fighting in the defensive battle that everybody else is. You know, that if people want it on the internet, well, we'll stand by to give it to them. But you know, I, I think they of all. The companies in the business were the ones most ecstatic when the pay TV operator stepped up and said, "We want to do this. You know, you don't have to go direct because we're going to do it on an authenticated basis." So, you know, two three years ago, that was still an open question as to whether you know they were really going to have the support of of the operators themselves who bear all the costs. Let's face it, for doing this, it's pretty cheap for HBO. Um, but um, uh, and it was not clear that they were willing to endure those costs. But, you know, I think we're, we're, uh, the programmers are fortunate that there's been just enough cord shaving and cord resisting and a little bit of cord cutting that, um, um, you know, uh, the operators got religion and said, uh, let's go on the internet and do TV everywhere. I think maybe one more, yeah. I'm sorry, a little louder. Uh, you know, IP streaming goes through the coaxial cable. So, you know, what... Connection, I'm just saying, connection between TV, but the router doesn't have a bad understanding cable, but I am seeing some of these, these products having IP streaming that literally just goes over Wi-Fi or over an FM connection instead of traditional products. Yeah, I think, that, you know, I mean, what we've, I think, seen from cable modems that started at, you know, very slow speeds and now we're doing 12 megs and 40 megs and 60 megs is that the plant can handle whatever we want to throw at it, um, you know, for the home. So I think for the home it remains about the, the proprietary network with IP content traveling over it. Um, but then outside the home, the beauty of it is it's the same IP content using the same technologies and boom, we're everywhere via Wi-Fi. So anyway, we've got a break and everybody travel safely home. Thank you much for being here.